Hi, I'm Gidget, and um, there is Mike Lidskin. Hey, Gidge. I'm pointing to Mike Lidskin. And below me in the center square is Al Block. And Al, hey. would you like to introduce hey, yourself? Hey, Gidget. Hey, Mike. Al Block here. Um, you know, what can I say about myself? I've been a musician a long time and uh, friends with Gidget for a long time. Oh my God, let's not even like wow. say how long. Yeah, we go way back. <laughs> There's stories. <laughs> oh, I need to hear some of these stories. These sound good. Oh, oh you've heard some of them. Ooh, I think I have. <laughs> yeah, Mike lives in Sacramento and oh. so he knows he knows that, um, what was it, a Ramada Inn that we all went to after the Peter Murphy show? Oh yeah, you did mention that, yeah. Tammy, I don't, you discovered I don't remember words. that. What? That story cuts you up anyway. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, um, Al was working for Peter Murphy at oh, the time. Wow. And we all went to Great America. And Tammy and Jean, the ghosts in the machine that they are, were really awful. And they saw Al in a boat going in this little raft thing, this ride that goes up and down the water. And they went, oh, let's drench Al, right? Because they'd known Al for a couple of years at this point, not knowing that he was on this little boat thing with Peter Murphy and all his kids. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they must have spent oh $4 and quarters to drench Al. And subsequently yeah. Peter Murphy. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, was a, that was a fun day. We did with that summer tour we did, we went to a whole bunch of water parks and great Americans and God, we I didn't know Peter Murphy was that into, you know, being out in the daytime like that, you know. Was he wearing full on black though when he was on the water rides? No, no. He was just wearing he was wearing shorts and a t shirt and you know, wow. no one would have recognized him, you know. A regular really civilian. Guy. Yeah. He's yeah. a great guy. Yeah, yeah, it was a lot of lot of fun with him. And um, and the best part was that he it's he he was so incredibly normal. He was just a family wow. man with kids. Yeah. And um, he was, um, it was a lot of fun. I mean, it was like a mortuary convention at Great America with all the people that were there. And he probably just wandered around the whole amusement park without anybody knowing who he was. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's and Al's got a lot of stories. What's that? Al's got a lot of stories. I got a lot of stories. That's initially how I started working with him was because he was in Los Angeles for a couple of weeks before he started his one tour and his wife and kids were there. And I, um, I got hired to drive them around um, him and his family. And then when the tour started, he just asked me to come along on tour with him. So oh, nice. What did you play? What instrument? I didn't play on that tour. I oh, was okay. just sort of a, a techni technically I was assistant tour manager, hmm. but uh, it was more just uh, taking care of Murphy and his family and, and ultimately the band too. I made sure they got to where they needed to go and did their interviews and got from the venue to the hotel, you know, without getting into trouble or hmm. too much trouble, you know, because they, they were a handful. Peter Murphy always went back to the hotel and, stayed in his room but the the guys in the band they were always up for finding some sort of trouble after the show so i i was uh, tasked with um making sure they got back to the hotel okay and didn't get arrested oh i think you're on think, mute Gidget. yeah gidget is muted Yeah, you still muted the little mute icon. Okay, <laughs> well, okay, let's let's bring this up to the future a little bit, or to the the recent present. Um, you had an album out about a year ago called "It Was All One Sprite Jewels." Great stuff. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, and you've since put out another album, another EP since then. That's quite prolific. Well, I put out another album in November called "Protest Songs." And then uh, I have an, a new EP coming out this Friday oh, wow. called Kind of Makes Me Smile, summer, summer EP. And um, looking forward to having that out. And just recorded those songs over the last couple months. 
Oh, wow. So what's the overall sound and feeling going to be like on the EP? Well, it's a little different than the past couple albums. The songs were written more on acoustic guitar, mm. and I was trying to make them happier and peppier than the, uh, than the songs on the albums. But um, a few of them are kind of happy and peppy, and a few of them are kind of, kind of sad and depressing. I, I couldn't help it. And so, so it's a kind of a mix, but it's, uh, it's, I've, tr- I've tried to make it a little more uplifting and, and happy. That's, yeah, that sounds like a, a different sound than what I'm used to. The one I'm familiar with is it was all once Bright Jewels. That one's got like some fiery under two minute punk songs and you have some more epic songs on that one. Yeah, yeah. Well, the last song on there is probably nine minutes. And yeah. it, um, that's uh, we my, I worked with my brother on that album, Kurt Block, Kurt. And, uh, and he uh, we just kind of made that into kind of this prog epic, the very last song, because we had all the two minute under two minute songs and we wanted to keep the record moving, you know, but when it got to the last song, the last song was kind of a slower song anyway. So we just decided to drag it out and uh, just kind of go nuts, you know? Yeah. You you can do what you want when you're at the end of the record. Well, that's exactly it because most people get there anyway. <laughs> so, so we we put all the two minute songs at the beginning and then just save the 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 epic for the last one, you know. And that's kind of how I try to try to do the songs. Try to keep them short and you know fast. And you know, if someone doesn't like the song, it's it's only going to be a minute or two until the next song, you know. And so yeah. You know, just keep keep things moving along. So, and then that way, this this new EP is a little different. The songs, uh, most of them are a little longer. You know, maybe even up to three minutes. You know, mm-hmm. and uh, and more acoustic guitar on it. There's no acoustic guitar on the other records, but a little more acoustic guitar on the new record. Can't wait to hear it. Hey, Gidge is back. We've been talking about stuff while you're gone. <laughs> yeah, we cover a lot of ground. I had to figure out how to turn self mode back on. Because <laughs> uh, I couldn't get the mute off. I'm new to all this, and uh, I'm old, so you know it's like teaching old dog new tricks. You're still not. a youngster, though, in relative terms here. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, so there um, is one song. There is one on song in. on the album that I'm really intrigued by. You're talking about my old stomping grounds, Cahuenga Pass. I grew up in the San Fernando Valley, so the less cool part of that record, you you ragged on it a little bit, but totally justified but there's a real life story behind that song Coenga Pass well yeah totally um well I lived in LA from god 1986 1985 I moved down there and uh lived there for 16 years well the story behind that song was um was I didn't have a car and I I went to meet someone you know, do you know that place out in Ventura Boulevard? I think it's Casa Vega. Yeah, Mexican Casa restaurant. Vega. Yeah, yeah. I think it was Casa Vega. We went to meet someone out there, and I, like, I took a bus out there or something. I was just really poor, poor musician, and mm. uh, went to meet them out there. And um, so I was waiting for them, and I, you know, I ordered a drink, a couple drinks, you know, kind of hoping that they would cover the tab, and uh, they never showed up. Uh-oh. And so, and so I'm sitting there, and it's a, uh, it's getting to be like happy hour time. And the place is filling up, and I've already had a couple drinks, and so I decide that I'm just gonna get out of there. So I just wait till it fills up a little bit, and then I just kind of snuck out, and ended up walking home through Coenga Pass, you know, Whoa. down Ventura Boulevard, and because I lived in Hollywood at the time. Uh, just down Highland Avenue um, near the Hollywood Bowl. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so I had to walk all the way home from Ventura Bowl or from Casa Vega down through the Coenga Pass. Wow, that's a long walk. But you know what's funny about that is it's probably the most level mountain pass you'll ever experience in your life. It's just like cut through the hills, really. Yeah, hard. right. Exactly. So it's not you're not going up a hill, but it's it's it, there's some spots there where the the shoulder is not very big, you know, and it's kind of. Oh, walking and cars are zipping by you you know but uh once you get down to the hollywood bowl it's a nice walk you know down highland avenue and you know i've never been there at all oh Oh, gidge road trip road trip um i uh your honor no floral canyon pass yes coinga no okay now that's a that's a steep 
steep hill. I kidnapped <laughs> some teenage boys once to go to the Houdini mansion. Wow. wow. It is up there. Yeah. 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 I didn't want to go by myself and I don't right. know LA at all. But I don't <laughs> think I've ever been to the Houdini mansion, but I have lots That's of friends. You got to kidnap teenage boys to do it. You can't go alone. Well, you, you you did that quite a bit, though, didn't you? Kidnap teenage boys. <laughs> Kidnap I, people, take stories. them on long car rides. <laughs> I've heard stories, Gidget. <laughs> now, 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 speaking of stories, you you say you didn't have a car when you went to Puyga Pass. You did have a car in L.A. at one point. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, later on I did. But for the first, God, four or five years I lived there, I didn't. And wow. I, I got around by, you know, if I had some cash, I'd take a cab or you know, take a bus or I did a lot of walking too, you know, which, I'm still uh, waiting for you to write a song about your Volkswagen bug that got stolen. Mm. Oh my God. Yeah. 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 <laughs> didn't have, didn't have that car very long. Boy. No, no that's yeah. the greatest. You've got to tell that one. Well, okay. Um, so uh, I was playing in concrete blonde and, um, and started to have a little money from playing with them. So I went out and bought myself this great 1966 Volkswagen Beetle. And it wasn't in the greatest condition, but I got it really cheap. And uh, it was the first car I really had in Los Angeles. And so I was driving around and, and I lived in this little, this tiny little studio apartment off Fairfax Avenue. And I could drive my car right into a parking space, right outside my door. And, uh, and just walk right in my little studio apartment. So one, one time I just came home and I had a few drinks and uh, I just parked the car and just kind of fell into my apartment. And um, someone came along and stole my car um, while I was sleeping and I heard them and I got up and I ran out and you know, whatever I was wearing or not wearing and I was running after them and they just drove the car oh, away. And just like in the movies. Yeah, yeah, it was, yeah, like a really bad movie, <laughs> but that kind of broke my heart because that mm. was a, that was a, it was a fun little car to drive around Los Angeles. Uh, it's going to make a great song if you write about chasing yes. the car down Melrose. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I'll have to figure that one out, you know. But, yeah, you know, I mean, it wasn't a bad area, so, you know, like, it kind of surprised me that someone stole it. Well, you know, it was a desirable car. From what I understood later, uh, for these kind of these Mexican gangs of that would they would target certain kind of cars, you know, like old Volkswagens and stuff. That was one of the cars they they used to target. So they probably saw it, and uh, I don't know. Just they they got it really fast. I'm sure it got taken apart or something, and. Uh, or driven down to Mexico really fast and just disappeared because uh, I went right to the cops and they they said they kept a lookout for it, but then they never saw it. So oh man, what are you gonna do? You know, and I think the next car I had was a Plymouth Arrow that I bought from somebody. I remember those. Me and my arrow. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, is that what the song was about? Me and my arrow. I think it turned into that, an old Nilsson song used for the commercial or something like they that. They used it yeah. for a commercial later, but yeah. That's I always thought it was from that movie. It is, yeah, The Point. Yeah. The point. Oblio. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't know, I don't, I don't even know what an arrow looks like. I'm going to have to look it up. It's one of those ugly 80s cars. Just uh, picture Plymouth 80s, you know, that's all you need to know. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Plymouth And is 80s. that when you were... Is that when you were working at the iconic uh, record store, Aaron's? No, that was before, I can't, I can't remember. Gidget, you're asking me those. Um, yeah, probably, probably. But then I had a, a Honda Accord later on too that was way better. Um, but uh, yeah, that's all kind of blurry. But yeah, the Plymouth Arrow kind of finally gave out. And- uh, I mean, I'm, I'm admitting how long I've known you. I mean. <laughs> yeah, no, you no, because I would tell people I would go go to Aaron's records and I'm like, oh yeah, Aaron Records is so cool. You got to meet Al. Al's so cool. I'm like, I know Al. <laughs> oh really? My... Yeah, you're like the cool dude there. Okay, so let me turn this around. Uh, Gidget and Al, how did you guys meet? 
I had a concrete blonde show when I was just barely old enough to get into the bar. Mm. San Francisco. San Jose. Cactus Club. San Jose's. The Cactus Club. Cactus Club. Yeah. Yeah, there's a Cactus Club is a famous bar um, on First Street. And Nirvana actually has a a bootleg recording from there. I don't Mm. know how it happened, but it's a famous, famous bar. And it's... um, it's just right there downtown and it was there for maybe 20 years and a lot of iconic bands played there and al played there wow yeah i think you and and funnily enough i took peter murphy's band there too after Mm -hmm. the show and we saw john doe play there with uh god who in his band the guy from the grisados and uh robert lloyd from television Richard mm. Lloyd from television was playing with him. Anyway, that's a, that's a whole other story. But yeah, the Cactus Club was great. And then uh, we we met then. And then when I was in my band, Wool, we played through San Francisco. And I don't know, we're just no Gidget forever. Wow. I, Wool great. was great live. That was probably the best band that you were in live. Thank you. Yeah, I think so too. I think so too. And, and that tour was just so much fun. I think you guys played at Night Break, maybe? Oh, God. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. There's all those San Francisco clubs that I just cannot keep straight after a while. Because um, when when I met you, we Concrete Blonde had just played like three different clubs around San Francisco. And then we played this place out in Marin County, too, I think. And I didn't go to that one. Yeah, I mean, I don't think anybody, I mean, it, it was like a sports no, bar or something. I'm pretty sure you played Slims. Slims, yeah, I believe so. That was, that was owned by Boz Skaggs. Yeah, right, I, I knew that, yeah. Just closed down, too. They're opening up as oh, really? some, some really sad excuse for a um, dance club or something like that. Yeah, yeah. and then after... I worked at DNA, which was next door. So, I mean, it was just like walking next door to go see Al and his band. And and uh, mm-hmm. then when you played at Night Break, I, I remember you guys played with a band that was really good. Yeah. Well, when was that when we played with Caius and... Caius! Caius and the Obsessed. We did a West Coast tour with them. And that's, I think, the first time we were up in San Francisco and we played, yeah, we, that was when we played Night Breaks. Yeah. Yeah. And we took them to, um, uh, we borrowed a car. Marcella drove, my friend Marcella drove us over to DNA because Hate Street is way on the other side from DNA, like a whole whopping five miles or something. <laughs> San Francisco is only seven miles long. That's across the city. And, yeah. Yeah. And, and we took them to DNA and uh, everybody knew you because you knew me and they treated them like royalty. We got that whole upstairs lounge for us <laughs> to hang out in because Al's royalty. Yes. <laughs> yeah, what, what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> and so I then, think you probably played San Francisco probably more than your brother did. Oh, I don't know, man. He was, he's a, he's a big shot in San Francisco. I think he played there a lot. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I mean, yeah, Wool played played there. Well, Concrete Blonde and Wool played there, God, so many times. So I, mm-hmm. I don't know. But my brother played there with the Young Fresh Fellows and mm-hmm. Fastbacks. That's right. I forgot about Young Fresh Fellows. Wow. Yeah. So so I don't know. He played there a lot. Too. But you played with L Seven. He never got a chance to play with L Seven. No, and Wool played a ton with L7. I mean, we did a couple European tours with them and a couple wow, American great. tours. We, we played with those girls a lot. And they I were think good. We, we also played with them out at that bar in Marin County, too. I don't know why we kept getting booked there, and I can't remember the name of it, but if you can imagine L7 and Wool in a, like a real boring sports bar <laughs> type place, it, it was, it was, we didn't, didn't go over well, either band, but uh, uh, boy, L7, they're, they're a fun band to tour with. I think with. you guys played Berkeley too, right? Berkeley Square. Yeah. yeah. Played there a lot, actually. I mean, with Wool and Concrete Blonde played there too. Yeah. Berkeley yeah. Square. Yeah. There was a scene there where we played Berkeley Square with Caius, with Caius and the Obsessed on that, that tour. 
and we, we were getting gas because we we're driving straight from there up to Seattle to play mm. and we're getting gas and we got in a serious altercation with some locals that, oh my God, they just didn't like the way we looked. And uh, it, Where it was, was that at? Scene. It was a gas station and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't tell you, but it was right around Berkeley Square because we, we left the club and we were driving straight to Seattle. Oh my God. But yeah, the, one of the guys in the Obsessed got punched out pretty good. And oh, geez. We all kind of managed to escape it, but uh, we just all jumped in the vans and we had three separate vans, you know, we had a, like a convoy going. And so we all jumped in the vans and, and took off, but- Getaway vans. Yeah, the wool, yeah, the wool tour had little little vans. And when you were with Concrete Blonde, you had the huge tour bus. No, no. We never had a tour when I was with Concrete Blonde, but we did. It was a motorhome. It was a motorhome. Yeah, it was a <laughs> Winnebago. Yeah, which was uh, which was a big mistake because we were we were hauling a trailer with all our gear and stuff, and the Winnebago was not not set up to haul all heavy stuff, and so we blew out the mm. transmission. Oh man. Yeah. It's like right outside Chicago, we we blew out the transmission, and we had a gig at the Metro in, mm. in Chicago and then we had to have the motorhome towed into Chicago, towed to the, the venue. And, um, Oh my God, there was, there was, Oh, there the was, Metro is a great place to play though. Oh man. It's fantastic. I've but, seen some well, really good bands at the Metro since I've moved out here. But I'll tell you, when we got there, we pulled up at the venue just in time to set up and play. So we got all our gear out, set up on the Metro stage, and we just had to get up and play. Boom. No, wow. you know, no relaxing or anything. It was because we were running late because our transmission blew. That's all the behind the scenes stuff the audience never knows about. You just come out there, you start banging away like professionals, and they never know the, the details, how you got there. That's right. That's because you were professionals. My yep. opinion, that's <laughs> you know, what's really funny is the Metro came up on my timeline this week, not for Al. But because I was at the Metro seeing a band play during Stanley Cup, oh, and wow. everyone was watching the Stanley Cup on their phones, and oh, the band God. was asking people what the score was. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. That's awesome. It was Fitz and the Tantrums. I do remember that. It came oh, on my yeah. timeline. Yeah, great band. Yeah. yeah. I've been to the Metro a few times. I, the first couple of years I lived in Chicago, I wasn't about... It wasn't like when I lived in San Francisco where I was at a band almost every day of the week. And when I lived right. in Seattle, I didn't go see a band every day of the week. I think Seattle's very different. Well, Seattle's certainly different now. It's not a, not a pleasant place wow. and expensive. And uh, yeah, it's going through some tough times right now. Wow, you're from I, there originally, I, right? Yeah, yeah, I grew up there. Okay. I grew up there. And the last time I was there was when I recorded that album. It was all Once Bright Jewels with oh. my brother at his studio. And uh, boy, it was, it had changed so much. And it was, it had changed so much. And, and I was there right before the pandemic hit too. Mm -hmm. And if you remember, Seattle was kind of like ground zero for yes. the start of that at that nursing home. And so that had just happened. And so we're there and people are starting to wear masks and, you know, hoard toilet paper and, you know, all that crazy stuff. And I'm sitting there going, Oh, I got to get out of here. So I got out of there just before everything kind of shut down. Luckily it's funny enough. because they were filming um, that Borat movie at the same time. Mm. Right. Right. Was that up and there? And people were seeing him all over there. And oh. I knew that you were working on your record there. And I just thought that was kind of funny. Oh boy. What if I could have run into Borat? <laughs> that would have been cool. Out of oh because I mean he got he got booed off the stage when they realized it, he was in costume right south of I'd say it was at the Puyallup Fairgrounds maybe that sounds that sounds right I, I saw that was, well you know I have a funny story because I lived in Roanoke Virginia which is southwest Virginia and he actually was there during his first movie if you remember the rodeo mm -hmm. scene when he starts talking about killing I don't know who it was you know and that was that was in Roanoke and uh there was a, the big story was about this guy that, that messed up the whole uh, the Star Spangled Banner or something he was supposed to sing it and they didn't know it was him until later on but the newspaper reported it 
as some crazy guy that crashed the place. And oh my God. You know what's funny is I think famous in England, but people in America didn't really know who he was. Yeah. 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 I think he's kind of picked up the torch from Andy Kaufman in some ways. He's punked audience, audiences in person and in mm-hmm. film. Yeah, totally. Totally. He, he's brilliant. And that last movie he put out was brilliant. The, the Rudy Giuliani scene. Oh, my mm-hmm. God. Yeah, that I, I didn't want to like it. And I loved it. And I ended up watching it again because I just yeah. had to watch it. We live in some crazy times now. But I want to go back to the Seattle thing because this is really funny. Is me and Al lost touch with each other, and I moved to Seattle, and I knew he had graduated from. Um, can I say the high school's name? Sure. Nathan Hale High School. Yeah. And a friend of mine that I met the first couple of weeks I lived there, uh, she graduated from Nathan Hale High School, and I'm like, oh my god, I wonder if she graduates same year as Al. So I go through her yearbook, and there's Al. And his brother graduated with her older sister. And I just thought that was so funny. And it was my space was fairly new. So I had to look up and find Al. And um, a couple of years later, I was starting, you know, with Woody Radio. And I looked him up. And then I got the My Favorite Martian stuff to play. And you oh. were really surprised that I was in Seattle out of all places. Yeah. Because I was like, oh, man, I'm never, I'm going to stay in San Francisco forever. And you had moved to... Rowan. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that is so wild because out of all the places in the world for you to move, I mean, you like went woo. And then I lasted until 13 years ago this week, I lasted in Seattle. I couldn't take it anymore. Like Al said, it's not the same. Mm. Um, 25 years ago, it was awesome. It was a great city. You could walk down Broadway, go to bookstores, go to Dick's, get a burger, you know, hang out with some rats by Dick's. Um, <laughs> It was it was a fun town. There was a two story Fred Meyer in Lake City. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And then slowly it just declined, and the the city just went from people being happy and rainy to mm. rainy and depressed. Mm. Yeah. In now, just a matter of months. It's a huge oh. gap in the wealthy and the the poor, you know. And plus, there's a lot of a lot of mental illness and drugs there, mm. and now a lot of homeless people and like I said the last time I was up there it was like I went to the Fred Meyer in Lake City you know that that's why I my first job was at that Fred mm-hmm. Meyer in Lake City when I was 16 and uh it, it it's th- that whole neighborhood there's like people living in their cars and motor homes on the side of the street it's just like crazy people running around it was mm. just it's just horrible anyway it seems like you hear a lot of you hear a lot of that when like too many people discover a city that's cool and they all move there too fast. The only well, time yeah. I was ever, the only What's time that? I was ever a victim of crime ever was in, at the Lake City Fred Meyer. Oh man. An old lady smacked me with her shopping cart and went off on me. Wow. Why? <laughs> that's it. And I had to file a police report. That's it. She was oh, nuts. Nice. Mental illness is big there. And, yeah, but is. Lake City was declining and we were looking at buying a place there. We bought North of the city in Briar. And um, it was one of those, those weird, you know, it's, I didn't really want to leave it because it was so beautiful. In fact, I'm even wearing my Dale Cooper t-shirt. Oh, you know, it's, 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 it's a cough. You know, my Twin Peaks shirt because Twin Peaks was filmed out there. And um, it was, it was, it was sad to leave it, but at the same time, it wasn't the same city I had moved to. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I think it, a lot of people moved there in the 90s, uh, you know, with because of the music scene and plus also because of the tech boom there, with Microsoft and Amazon. And now Amazon has kind of taken over the city. Yeah. And uh, it's, uh, they're buying a lot of property and uh, it's, they're kind of, I don't know, just them, but those kind of businesses are, are, they're bringing a lot of money and people are making money, but at the same time, squeezing the middle class down to, you know, poverty. And that's why I think you get a lot of, a lot of homeless people. And, Wait, did uh, you say San Francisco? Oh, you're still talking about Seattle. Sorry. Still talking about Seattle. <laughs> same, right, I, same there. Yeah, right. Same thing. And, I had a t-shirt I bought when I moved to Seattle said I came to Seattle to score some snack and I got a record deal instead. <laughs> Robin Hitchcock wrote a song about that called Viva C Tech. The chorus is we've got the best computers and coffee and smack. Yeah. 
And that about says it all right there. Yeah, he wrote and it here. in the late 90s, yeah. Good and the, the Posies have a song about um, a hotel. And people think, is I want to go, I want to go to Ontario. But it's really, the Ontario is this little drug hotel south of uh, downtown. Where you I like see the, the hookers really? and everything. Wow, I did not know that. That's why yeah, I, I, took me, I had to figure it out because I'm like, I'm really sure they don't want to go to Ontario. And I was driving down south of the viaduct one day and there it was the Ontario hotel and clearly a drug deal was going on right in front of it. And, and that just like uh -oh. encapsulated the whole music scene for me right there. Wow. Wow. But I did love it there. It was just kind of weird to know that I had gone and one of my friends graduated with Al and then, you know, we reconnect and, you know, it's a long time friendship. It's great. Yeah, I, I can't believe you saw my high school pictures. That's that's pretty funny. Yeah, you had like a button up shirt, like one of those like polyester kind. I'm sure. I'm sure. I did. One of those angel flight kinds. I, I graduated in 1978. You know, it's like what else? You what else are you gonna wear? <laughs> wow. Yeah. What year did you? I wasn't. Graduate I wasn't like? cool at all either. So. Um, 1979. So just after Al. Yeah. I'm not gonna admit because I'm just the baby of the group. You are the yeah, baby. Yeah. You, you should be proud. Fly that flag proudly. 1985. <laughs> big year. Big year for Gen X. Yeah. No, my, <laughs> my generation is surviving everything just fine because we're used to being weird. We're <laughs> used to being, leave me alone. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> so um, anyway, so Al, you're our inaugural um, coffee, tea, and G meeting. Uh, you just want to throw people together and not have like a agenda. Is there anything you want to ask us? Well, how did you guys get into Woody Radio and, and uh, become the, the, the online radio celebrities that you are? I wouldn't call it a celebrity. Mike's a celebrity. No. I'm never on the air. Oh. Mike, how did you get into this? Well, um, if we want to go way back, I've been doing radio here in Sacramento for like 23 years. When I moved to Sacramento, um, I was with my ex and she wanted to check out the public access TV facility here. So I went down with her and it said TV and radio. And I thought, oh my gosh, childhood dream right there. So I learned how to do radio, got right on the wow. air, was on the public access uh, radio station for like 20 years. And meanwhile, I, I found Gidge online as, as everybody does. You, know, you meet like-minded folks. And I thought she's pretty cool. She had a profile picture with one eyeball. And I thought that's a good looking eyeball there. I better friend that. And so, um, so we chatted, found out she does radio, got into Woody radio, was a fan long, long before I ever joined. And then at some point, Gidget asked me if I'd ever want to join. And, you know, Gidget doesn't really ask. She actually tells. So I just joined up and, 2017 after meeting her in person we decided that we were actually okay and i i said oh i can only do maybe two shows a week a month you know just i can't devote all that much time to it but i couldn't get enough of woody radio so it became three then four and then at one point gidget said aren't you supposed to take a week off in there somewhere i said oh yeah i forgot i'm just having too much fun oh and that's then, great and then the pandemic give hit. people choices no <laughs> um the choice it's is a Leo you, thing. the choice there's only one Absolutely choice you do radio. he gets it yeah you do we radio. That's your choice. Places, do we <laughs> just make people do things, right? <laughs> but the pandemic hit and I ended up giving up the other show. I thought, well, this is cool. I love the attitude here because Woody radio is an all rock station. You know, I love the place I was at before, but you know, there's also religious shows and political shows. And here it's just, it's all rock. Everybody does a show. That's one form or another of some kind of rock and roll. So it's a, you know, just a big team here. I love it. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I like uh, Mike DeAngelis, too. He's He's got a good show. He's very yeah, the good. two mics on Saturday have really cemented a yeah. lot at the station. Mike came from um, San Francisco. He's from KSAN. Right, right. And he's a right. really sweet guy. And he just kind of just fell into us. Yeah. That's basically how we get people. I mean, we've had, um, we've had a lot of DJs over the years. Some of them have been assholes. Some of them have been nice. Um, but the ones while they're here with us we're a family we're all like rejected people who need each other <laughs> it works right. totally works you, you pick the people you want they to put up with, with me <laughs> everybody uh, loves gidge i'm a little nuts <laughs> just, a, just a little 
What? Her lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> totally sane. She just puts that that on to just kind of keep us, you know, guessing. No, 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 no. Al knows I'm nuts. <laughs> She's a little nuts. She's a little nuts. But in a good way. In a good way. You, you kind of have to be. I mean, I've been around long enough to know that none of this really seems real. It is real, but it's only as real as you want to allow it to be. Hmm. So you might as well have fun while you're here and make a difference. Yeah. That very good point. Good point. Well, now that you said that for the next interview, I'm getting one of those cool backgrounds so you don't see all this stuff back here. <laughs> yeah, you know. Well, so you, you heard noises around here, so we all know that I'm at work. <laughs> oh man yeah i don't have any backgrounds on here i do on my work on mine either. i don't know where they come from you gotta add them i mean i i have them on my work computer but not my personal computer yeah and you know what's really funny is that al just keeps popping up in woody um like little scenarios so um when i found him and brought him back in here uh, somebody else had already been playing wool and I don't remember which DJ it was. I think it might've been Dave Fox. And then a couple of years later, we had a DJ named Joey Camp who kept talking about how there was this, this guy who used to be in a band in Roanoke. That was yeah, so Joey cool. from Roanoke. Yeah. 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 And he kept talking about this guy, Al. And then when we realized it was, oh my God, <laughs> like small that's, world. That's so funny. Yeah. I remember when he mentioned that he knew you. And, oh my God. <laughs> and you went, oh my God, that psycho. <laughs> it's a small world. Wow. Yeah. 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 So Al, Al's meant to be here in some way or another. Totally. Now just wait till we make him a DJ. Things are going to get real then. Oh. That <laughs> he is multi talented. Eh, I don't know if I'm multi talented. More than one, Just right? Just wait people see yeah. this new video with you walking around and being all ambient in the house. I think that's really cool. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. You're going to be like this new, this new Studley Dudley. Get groupies with that one. No, I think those days are past. <laughs> Whose days are in the past, KG? <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> You'd be surprised. People yeah. like a mature man these days. I'm way mature. I'm, just, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I'm like over matured. Well, you know, we have that woody casting couch. We only play good looking musicians. You know? <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Yeah. Okay. I have to embarrass everybody. Yes. Vodka. The interview gets better starting now. There Jeez, you go. All I got is boring iced tea. <laughs> Okay, it's really water, but it's colored the same as vodka, right? Yeah, there yeah. you go. Yeah. Might as well be. I mean, I, I don't drink when I do. I, I really think that we're going to have to have like a Bloody Mary day here where my Bloody Mary is just basically like tomato juice and I just pretend that I'm drinking. Oh, yeah, yeah, the mix is great. The mix is really you have good. like a brunch. You put a stalk of celery in it. Yeah, mm. I actually trained Dylan how to make Bloody Marys. I mean, I know he's only 14, but I said, you never know if you're going to need this skill in life. <laughs> right. It's a great skill to have. You know, it kind of goes with his long hair. <laughs> He's like a junior bartender in training. It's perfect. Right. No, I, I don't drink. And so it, it was just, it was just kind of a funny thing. So I got the iced tea. I, I live on caffeine. Yeah, I'm afraid I do too. Yeah. Do you have your coffee with you, Al? No, not right now. It's almost 10 o'clock. You know? Oh, wow. There's no such thing as a cutoff time for caffeine. <laughs> well, it is if you want to go to sleep, which, you know, I, I need to do. I was I get up real early. And, uh, so, no, no caffeine after 4 o'clock, probably. Yeah, I try to, well, when I'm at work, I stop about 8 or 9, just so mm -hmm. I can get to sleep and go to work the next day. Wow. But I'm working a bunch of doubles this week, so it's just pretty much caffeine and no sleep. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Understand caffeine is liquid sleep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the glorious world of rock and roll where I have to work doubles to pay for Woody Radio. Yeah, you know. Mm. Glamorous. 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 <laughs> Glamorous and glorious. Yeah. And I put on lipstick for it. 
Yeah. I certainly don't do this for my shows. You can <laughs> expense the lipstick though. It's a business expense. Oh my God, that's right. I can. It I'm addicted now. to Ipsy bags. I have like so much lipstick. It's, it's been my thing. Lipstick has always been my thing. So, and now it's going, what does lipstick have to do with anything? It's important. I well, take your word for, for a it. radio DJ, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It will, you know, I got a face for radio. <laughs> you do now. Look, we all do now. <laughs> this is like video radio. So I'm going to be like, I'm going to be a little Mike Lidskin ish here. And I'm going to ask, okay, so Al, here's like the basic boring questions before we let you get back and go to bed because you probably have to work in the morning with your mm. glamorous rock star lifestyle. Um, what is your favorite food? Yes. Um, favorite food probably enchiladas i'm hungry now it's dinner Good time choice. on the west coast i'm so hungry now for enchiladas <laughs> yeah you beat me to it Gidge. that's great great though keep going you're not done um, yet um when was the last time you had a fortune cookie <laughs> probably before the pandemic here you want one i've got several oh <laughs> One Mike, open up a fortune cookie for him and read him his fortune. Oh, that's a great idea. Let's do it. Um, okay, this is what I do. It's a feature on my um, Tuesday night show where I open up a fortune cookie because I run out of topics. So we're going to just dive right into this one. You're seeing the I magic. I saw an episode of the Kumars this week where they actually had fortune biscuits. It's not the same. Fortune biscuits. Crunch, crunch, crunch. Okay. Ah, here's Al's fortune for the week. The human spirit is stronger than anything that can happen to it, such as a walk through Quenga Pass. Did you add the in bed? <laughs> Let's try it again. The human spirit is stronger than anything that can happen to it in bed. Adds a whole new meaning to it. Um, okay, that makes it's sense. It's the cheeky one, and she adds in bed every time he does it on Tuesdays. <laughs> Totally works. Who does that? Dean Seavers from the Decibels adds in bed to fortunes too. It, it works. And Mike, do you have any questions for Al before we let him get his beauty sleep? Yes, I do. I do. So hey, Al, man. what's your secret talent that we haven't heard of yet? Some secret talent or superpower that you're good at that people don't know about? Uh, I'm a great cook. Ah. Um, I make spaghetti and I make toast and coffee and uh, those are my specialties sounds like breakfast here maybe <laughs> yeah most people would probably not know that about me very cool very cool well you know as as an assistant tour manager sometimes you probably had to keep people eating keep them fed well yeah then i just run downstairs to the hotel coffee shop and <laughs> pick up <laughs> coffee for everybody so yeah not much cooking going on there but True. uh Mostly, mostly just picking up bar tabs and uh, cab fares and, uh, you know, making sure everybody got into their hotel rooms, you know. I think they call that the tour dad. It's to totally what it is. And you just hope no one gets arrested or anything and you have to go down and bail them out. And uh, Yeah, that's not that paying cash with, anymore. You have to expense that. That happened with wool once. We, we mm. were in Florida at a club and uh, Pete, the singer, started this big fight in the crowd <laughs> so we all jumped in and it was this big brawl and the cops came and dragged him off and arrested him wow and, uh, we had to figure out how, where he was and they go bail him out mm. that was and then he had to go back there for a court date a month later so yeah not pretty not not glamorous not pretty no. Yeah. Great story. Great story. Now, did you ever work in a restaurant when you lived in Seattle or did you just learn I, this after you moved to Roanoke? I did. I did. I, I worked in a restaurant, um, a couple restaurants downtown. These, these kind of breakfast places and bakeries downtown. And then I worked in this restaurant on Lake Union up off East Lake, if you remember where that was, mm -hmm. uh, like kind of South Lake Union, where Amazon's bought everything now. But back then, they, they had great little restaurants down there. So I worked there. 
I, I, I moved to, I lived in New York briefly in 82 and came back and worked at the restaurant for a while in Seattle and then a couple other places before moving to Los Angeles in 85. So yes, yeah, so, so I've done my time as a prep cook and a bus boy and a dishwasher. Wow. I think some of the best restaurants in the United States are in Seattle. There's some good ones. Great. And right in Lake Union, that whole area, the original Red Robin was there. Yeah, yeah. The burger joint, the chain burger joint. Yeah, yeah and the you would original walk the floors, one. Were, floors were crooked. Yeah, it's under the freeway. It's under Interstate 5, uh, like East Lake. Is it East Lake? And when it cuts up to Broad, Broadway, right? Right. I think that's it. Yeah. Yeah, I used to go there quite a bit. Yeah, that was the first one. But I preferred the one over at um, Northgate Mall. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, right. I used to run into Seattle rock stars at Northgate Mall. Wow. Wow. Yeah, because they're, oh. they're, you know, there you're not famous. You're just a person that lives in Seattle. Yep. That, everybody Northgate. treats everybody the same, or at least they did then. Well, that's that's where where the way it was whenever you saw Seattle people and you go to the Crocodile or Moe's those clubs and I mean there'd be everybody there from all the bands no matter who was playing and no one no one treated them any different I mean it was great I was at the um Posey's one of the Posey's last shows mm -hmm. and because they had so many last shows uh -huh. and it was at Chop Suey and um I think it was it was Chop Suey before it was Chop Suey it was a bar and it had pinball machines and mm -hmm. that actress, Adrian Shelley, was sitting right at the bar with me. Adrian Shelley? Just, wow. And I just like, oh, wow. But I didn't want to bug her because it was like Seattle and we don't bug people there. Yeah. Yeah. I saw Barry Boswick jo jogging in Lake Union once. Wow. And um, Perry King. I saw so many more famous people there than I ever did living in San Francisco. Hmm. Yeah. Never bothered any. My mom bothered people. <laughs> my mom followed around Al from Toll Time. Oh, wow. So much that he had to go up to me and say, can you please get your mom off me before I have to file a restraining order? <laughs> I'm so excited it was him. That's awesome. Because yeah. mm. Seattle makes cool people. As it in does. Al. Right? Uh, I wish it was a nicer place these days, but, you know. <laughs> Hey, you know, if I still live there, I could sell my house for eight hundred thousand dollars. I know, right? I know, and I sold it for three. Yeah. And I only paid one. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you you ended up all right after all, you know. Yeah, yeah, and you ended up in a nice place like Roanoke. Yeah, and now I'm in Norfolk. Now I live in Norfolk, Virginia. People oh, just okay. like saying it that way so they can get away with saying it on NPR, right? I say Norfolk. People on NPR, they say Norfolk. And like they, you know they're smirking trying to get away with something. Well, and, and the, a lot of people pronounce it Norfolk. Really? Yeah, wow. that's kind of the old Southern, old Virginia way. Norfolk, Virginia. When I lived in New Jersey, I lived in a town called Forked River. It was spelled forked. And if you said it too fast, it sounded like fucking river. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, and we have a DJ that lives right above it. Oh, we have two DJs, John I would and John. Say, we, yeah, we have like four DJs from New Jersey. It's pretty. I know Jersey's great. like popular. We don't have any in Seattle. Mm -hmm. Bunch in California. Yeah. It, Woody Radio's been a, a station for fourteen years now. Fourteen wow. years playing out. Wow, it's in eighth grade now. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll let you go, Mister Block. Will you come well, back and do this again with thank us? Thank you, Al. Absolutely. Anytime, guys. Thank you very much for, for having me. It was, it was great chatting. I don't get to chat to a lot of a lot of cool people, you know? So, oh, we're cool. Oh, awesome. Mike, we're cool. He said we're cool. You guys are cool. Oh, absolutely. Cool. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> so nice meeting you, Al. Really, really enjoyed chatting with you. Yeah, likewise, Mike. Likewise, Mike. And great seeing you, Gidget, as usual. Great seeing you, too. And, and um um hopefully we get to do this again soon and uh, you have a good night and get a good night's sleep because it is late out there it is thank thank you guys and yeah let's definitely do it again this was yes. fun and, and if everybody goes to the woody radio cult page i posted his new video today and i it's will awesome. be getting it on the air as soon as he gives it to me yeah awesome song. i saw it video is great awesome song
Thank you. The EP already. comes out this Friday on Green Monkey Records. Okay, if you get it to me before Friday, I'll play it on Friday on the air. Yay, I sure will. Yeah, I'll play it uh, Thursday night at midnight if you want me to. <laughs> That'd be fine. That'd be fine. <laughs> we'll, give it the, we'll give it the whole royal treatment. Excellent. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for giving us your, your time of your day. Yes. All right. Thanks, guys. Let's thank do it you. again sometime, anytime. Thank you. I'll talk to you guys later. Bye. Bye.